you mind if I begin asking you a very personal question? And I'd like to have a show of hands if you don't feel it's too personal of a question. How many of you have a cell phone? Hold your hands up, let me see. Oh. Have you ever had a call drop out on you while you were talking? Have you ever had the other party lose contact but you didn't know it and you kept talking? Did you feel silly when you realized nobody was listening? I remember one time on an extremely passionate um, well, passionate is not the right word I suppose to use but um, intense yeah thanks dear I needed help uh, an intense conversation I was making my case for something and I thought I did a very eloquent job and I paused to hear the response <laughs> and they lost me before I even launched into my argument or whatever it was <laughs> and I thought they weren't even listening <laughs> and it was so sad you know every now and then advertisers come up with certain slogans that become sort of a part of the American um, uh, language and uh, somebody uh, matter of fact someone told me it was a Seventh-day Adventist marketer that came up with the catch got milk obviously they're not vegans got milk I mean have we all heard that now I mean it's sort of become and uh, people at uh, very humorous times will sometimes say got milk and uh, just two words uh, another example of one of those very clever slogans is the one of this the Verizon phone guy that goes around and he says what does he say <laughs> can you hear me now <laughs> and uh, you find yourself laughing whenever you hear yourself saying that because uh, when you're involved in public speaking I'm awful s fiddling with my microphone I'm saying can you hear me now <laughs> But um, really, that is a question that people ask all the time. Can you hear me now? Um, maybe if I adjust the antenna, can you hear me now? How about if I stand over here? Is that better? Can you hear me now? Our message this morning is dealing with the subject of the silence of God. And uh, to really understand this, we need to begin with a story that will really be the context or the catalyst for the other points that we're going to bring out and uh, one of those important themes will be on the idea of the times when God is silent please turn in your Bibles we're going to read the whole story then we'll back up we'll comment on it a little bit turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15 verse 21 and then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Zidon now, pause, just to give you a little background. Principally, the ministry of Jesus was in the region surrounding the Sea of Galilee. Not too long after John the Baptist was executed, the Lord left that region and he went up to the northwest near the ocean, in the mountains there up by the ocean. He could overlook the cities and they were known for their sin of uh, Tyre and Zidon. And you can hear many of the prophecies deal with those two places. Um, and while he's up there something interesting happens it says and behold a woman of Canaan now if you read in Mark chapter 7 it calls her, her a Syrophoenician Greek woman and here it calls her a Canaanite it's all the same thing what this is to, uh, Syria and Phoenicia uh, this woman evidently was one of the descendants of the original race that lived in the promised land and uh, they had not completely expelled them at this point and so this is a Syrophoenician woman she evidently speaks Greek which most of the disciples and the people in Israel spoke Greek as well as some Latin and Aramaic and Hebrew and so this woman who is everything but a Jew she's called a Canaanite she's called a Syrian a Phoenician and a Greek but she's not a Jew Behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and she cried out to him. Some versions say she cried after him, meaning as he's going down the road, she's following him and she's crying after him. And she's saying to him, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Now evidently she had heard something about Jesus. Uh, they all knew anyone that lived anywhere near the Jewish territories knew that the Jews were looking for the Messiah who must be a son of David 
He was often called the son of David. And she had heard maybe from someone in her region, maybe one of the Jews who lived up around Tyre and Zidon, had gone down, had heard about the miracles of Jesus. Word came back, she's got a daughter who is severely plagued, vexed by the devil. And she thinks Jesus is her only hope. She finds him. She follows him down the road, pleading, and says, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is severely demon-possessed, severely vexed, afflicted by an unclean spirit, Mark says. She's got a daughter. And then in Mark it says, a young daughter who is severely afflicted by the devil. And we don't know if this was some combination of demonic uh, possession, harassment, with a physical malady, but her daughter is in a serious condition. And this is the part that really troubles people. And it will sort of be the springboard for a lot of what we're going to say. He answered her not a word. He answered her not a word. It makes it sound very clear that he just totally ignored her. And the disciples may have been surprised by this because Jesus was always so patient and gracious with the crown and virtually every other time in the Bible when anybody came to Jesus asking for help, he helped them. He responded. It, it seems so out of character for Jesus. He answered her not a word. He keeps going down the road as though he does not hear her. And so the disciples said to him, here are the church leaders, they say, look, she's, she's not going to settle for us telling her to go away. Lord, she wants you to help. You're going to have to tell her to go away or she'll never leave us alone. She's crying after us. They said, Lord, send her away. I'm in verse 23. She cries out after us. Tell her to leave us alone. I mean, after all, she's not a Jew. We don't need to waste any time and energy and miracle power on her. And Jesus said something that bothers us even more. He turns to this woman and he says, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, I thought the gospel said, whosoever will. Was Jesus only sent to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel? And she came and worshipped him. Now, most of us, if, if you, know, you say, look, Lord, please help me. And he says, no, I cannot help you because you're not part of the club. You're not one of our members. I've only been given a mandate to exclusively help a certain race of people and you're not the right race. You'd be a little offended by that and you'd go away. But she took that as an opportunity. She doesn't get discouraged, but she takes that as an open door. And she says, true Lord. And then she worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. I'm in verse 25. Lord, help me. She's pleading. But he answered and he said, it is not good. It's not appropriate. It's not meat to take the children's bread, their food, and throw it to the dogs. Whoo! Now, if I wasn't discouraged after his first response, that would have been it for me. Uh, for, I mean, you know, we've all got a little bit of dignity, and even though we may be desperate, if somebody says, look, I'm not taking what belongs to God's children and giving it to the dogs, and what's implied is dogs like you. Isn't that understood? This doesn't sound like the same Jesus we read about everywhere else. Why did he do that? It's not good to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Oh, she still doesn't give up. And she says, true Lord. She's not even arguing and saying, well, that was rude, but I'm going to still plead. She says, that may be. It is true. Maybe we are unclean. But even the dogs, and the word she uses here is the puppies, even the little dogs get the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus, at that point, he takes a 180 degree turn and he says, Oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And the good news is the story ends by saying her daughter was healed that very hour because of her persistence in prayer. She got what she was asking for. Now we want to back up and we're going to look at that story from uh, the vantage point of what does it mean? Well, first of all, I think we better understand what's happening here in the story. Then we'll talk a little more about the silence of God. 
There is a teaching that is clear in the New Testament that is often misunderstood. The ministry of Jesus was intended to go first primarily to the Jewish people. You can read, if you look in, for instance, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. Jesus told the twelve apostles when he sent them out, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles. Wait, I thought Jesus said go to all the world. Yes, that was afterward. But during his ministry, part of their training, he told them not to go in the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter even into the city of the Samaritans. But I thought the apostles later went into the Samar Samaria. When Jesus ascended in Acts chapter 1, he said, Preach in all the world, beginning in Judea, Jer Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But not yet. There was a sequence to the way the Lord did things. He said, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter into the city of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, the Lord tells us that he had some of his sheep that were lost, and his ministry was to begin with them. Later, it would transfer to another group. Uh, let me give you some more examples. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Notice, for the Jew first. Now, wait, he says everyone, but there's a sequence. Who first? the Jew first and also for the Greek that would include this woman in our story why is the Lord doing things that way John chapter 4 verse 22 Jesus said to the Samaritan woman you worship you do not know what in other words let me modernize that you don't even know what you worship we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews am I starting to make a case here Luke chapter 24 verse 47 and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem now let me see if I can modernize this point why was the Lord being exclusive well first of all the whole purpose of the gospel coming through the Jews is that they were to be the forefront of proclaiming the message to the world why did the Lord do it that way because they had the scriptures, they had a better concept of God than any of the pagans. To teach a Jew about Jesus is a much shorter leap than it was to take a Canaanite pagan who believed in many gods and try and teach them about the Messiah coming. Let me modernize this. When I do evangelism and I preach our message, and we have an exclusive message for this age, it's a special message. Exclusive may not be the right word. It is a lot easier for me to preach that message to people who already have a Christian background and help them to embrace the entire gospel than those who are coming from just a total pagan background. Does, do you see what I'm saying? It's less of a step for them to go from at least being raised with some comprehension of the Bible and the principles of Christianity and the, the concept of there being one true God to make that little step to understanding the full gospel than to go from you know, Hinduism or Buddhism or you know, some of these monotheistic religions of the world and transfer them to Christianity. It's a lot of retraining in the mind. For the Jews to accept Jesus made sense. You know, when a chicken lays an egg or just about any creature, that chick is inside within the egg and part of that egg develops into the chick and part of that egg is the food for the chick while it's in the egg. Jesus came from the Jewish nation and that same nation where he was hatched, forgive the analogy, was to also be the, the springboard, it was to have the stored calories to send him throughout the world. Make my case a little further. When the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost and 3,000 were baptized, what religion were they? Jews. There were dwelling in Jerusalem at that time, Jews, devout men from out of every nation under heaven. Jews had come from all over the world. For Peter and the apostles in the upper room to preach to those Jews, in one evangelistic meeting they had a baptism. Now can we typically do that in our society? Can you take the average pagan on the streets in North America and, and uh, make a Bible-believing Christian out of them in one meeting and baptize them? 
Or is there a little more training involved? Jesus said, go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them. More teaching involved. But the Jews already had those basics. They only needed to really understand who the Messiah was. That's why Philip could baptize the Ethiopian in one Bible study. He was coming from Jerusalem, reading the Bible. He already had that background. And so it began with the Jews. He was first to preach to them. You remember in Daniel chapter 9, the 490 year prophecy, 70 weeks are determined for thy people. The gospel was to go first to the Jews. Three and a half years Jesus taught the Jews in person, three and a half years through the apostles. Now so when Christ said, I'm not sent to the Gentiles but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, his ministry, the primary focus of his ministry was to be to that group seems a little harsh that he would say it's not appropriate to take the children's food and give it to dogs. It still makes us cringe, shudder to picture Jesus saying that. Let me, let me share something with you that I think may help in all your future Bible study. Catch this. A lot is lost in the Bible because you are not hearing how something is said instead of just what is said. Have you noticed before that you read something and it will sound completely different when you hear a person say it a certain way? Um, you know, a, a mother can say, get over here right now. And she can get a whole different response than if she says, get over here right now. <laughs> if you wrote it down, it sounds the same either way. Spelled exactly the same. But was it different? Or you can have Jesus say, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, with tears in his voice. Or, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And I sometimes listen to Bible tapes, or I'll hear other preachers take the words of the apostles or Jesus, and they'll say them in a way I know Jesus never said it. What they said is accurate. But the way they say it changes everything. The inflection of the voice, the expression on the face, the Bible doesn't always give us that, does it? And I think that there was something about Jesus' face and the tone of his voice that invited her to continue asking. I don't think he drove her and get away from me, you dog. And it wasn't like that. I think there was almost like a reluctance, a sadness in the way he said it that invited her to continue pleading. So take that in mind. You know, I hear these preachers, they take the place where Jesus goes to the temple and he chases out the money changers and they've got him screaming at the top of his lungs and completely out of control I don't think it was like that and when Jesus tells the elements during the storm at the sea to peace be still you know the way that reads in the original language is he simply says shalom Jesus doesn't have to scream at anything to get anything done not like some of us parents he could speak and it happens he's God you think when God created the world, he had to shout, Let there be light! <laughs> Does God have to do it that way? Because the light has got to be woke up? And so how the Lord says something makes a big difference. And if you could have been there and seen the look on Jesus' face and heard the tone of his voice, it would change the whole story for you. It would make a big difference. The other point is you need to transform yourself, transfer yourself back to that day and age Everyone who knew the Jews knew that the Jews viewed all people in two categories. There were the clean and the unclean. You were either a Gentile or you were a Jew. What's a Gentile? Anything that's not a Jew. And they were the chosen and everyone else was not chosen. And everyone knew that. In the Jewish categorization of animals, how many categories were there? Two. Clean and unclean. You couldn't say this was almost clean. So they're like pregnancy. You're the pregnant. You're not pregnant. You're not halfway pregnant. I mean, it's just something that's all the way or not at all. And so when Jesus said it is not appropriate to take the children's food and give it to the dogs, that was terminology they un all understood. Uh, keep in mind, when we say to the dogs, Jesus said, Matthew 7, verse 6, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. He's talking about wasting your time on people who are determined to be unclean. You're wasting your time. 
In Psalms 22, verse 16, For dogs have surrounded me, Jesus said. Speaking about this as a messianic prophecy of when he's on the cross. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked. Philippians 3, Paul said, Beware of dogs, evil workers. Now, how many of you have pet dogs? Eh? About the same number that have cell phones, right? <laughs> We've got three dogs. Uh, we like dogs. Dogs are nice. Uh, they're smart. I mean, you get a good dog. I don't want a pit bull, but we got a Labrador. They're the opposite of pit bulls. They will lick you to death. But, uh, oh, I know, some pit bull lovers are going to come up to me later. I don't want to hear it. Leave me alone. <laughs> Revelation 22, 15. But the outside, speaking of those who are in the kingdom and outside the kingdom, but outside are dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. So the, the dogs, when he says that, it was talking about the Gentiles, those who did not know God. You remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? The only comfort that Lazarus has is the dogs come and lick his sores. I know that sounds awful, but the only comfort that the, the lost had that were not with the rich man was from the dogs, meaning the Gentiles. And so this was a term that they understood. Now, one more thing is happening here. Jesus did not send her away. The disciples came to Jesus and said, send her away. Jesus was testing his disciples and the woman. He was testing her faith and he was testing their love. She was following after him and instead of them saying, Lord, why don't you help her? They said, Lord, send her away. How often, the, here you get the church. Remember the people were hungry and the disciples said, send them away. They're hungry. It's not our problem. It's their problem. The mothers came with their children and the disciples said, send them away. He's too busy for this. And always, in every other occasion, Jesus says, don't send them away. You feed them. Let me bless the children. So he's testing the disciples to see, have you learned anything yet? And this woman who has a need that they know that Jesus can take care of, instead of saying, Lord, help her. In, in pleading, interceding in her behalf, they say, Lord, uh, she's a Gentile. Just tell her to be gone. And so he answers her, the way the religious leaders of his day would have done it. He wanted them to hear how they sounded. It's not nice to take the children's food and give it to the dogs. That woman's faith just kept getting stronger with every barrier. And so she persists. Says, yes, but even the dogs get the crumbs. Well, what a clever argument. You know, when you have, when you're praying for someone you love, you can become very eloquent. And then Jesus answered her prayer. You know, this is not the only time that Christ answered the prayer of a Gentile. You, of course, know that he preached to the Samaritan woman. And then there's that story of the centurion. You can read about that in Matthew as well. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. Now when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. This is a Roman centurion. He's not a Jew. He's a Gentile through and through. Pleading with him saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I'll come and heal him. Now see, he wasn't excluding the Gentiles. I'll come and heal him. And the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. You see, it's interesting. This lady said, I'm not worthy also. One of the advantages that the pagans had over God's people is they realized they were unworthy. Sometimes we think because we're in the church we're worthy. We're not worthy. No more than they are. None of us are worthy. I don't want what I deserve. Do you want what you deserve? Do you know what we deserve? <laughs> Penalty for sin is death. He said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to this servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled, and he said to those who followed him, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, no, not even in Israel. And he said, many will come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, the time will come when these dogs, these unclean, these Gentiles, they're going to be in the kingdom but the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness and they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
He said to the centurion, Go your way as you have believed, let it be done to you. And his servant was healed that very hour. Similar thing. A Gentile comes except he, he heals the centurion servant. Now you know what else is interesting about this? There are only two times in the Bible that Jesus commends somebody for great faith. I mean, so often he tells the apostles, Oh, ye of little faith, where is your faith? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? This is what he's always saying to the church people. The two times he commends faith, they're both non-members. Isn't that interesting? He told this woman, Great is your faith. Be it unto you according to your faith. He tells the, tells the Roman centurion, I've not seen faith like this, not even in Israel. You know what that tells me? This is very, very important. Sometimes we have confused saving faith with doctrinal understanding. The Bible says the two characteristics of God's people, they keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus. And as an evangelist, I would be tempted to say during evangelistic meetings, the faith of Jesus is an understanding of law and grace. The faith of Jesus is understanding your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The faith of Jesus, and go through the different doctrines and say, this is the faith that Jesus had. And make it a doctrinal issue. But the fact is, the two people that Christ commended for having the greatest faith had the least doctrinal understanding. They weren't even members. But their faith was the faith he commended. They put no limits on God's power. The centurion said, you don't even need to come. I believe you can speak the word and that'll be enough. I've got that kind of faith. And Jesus commended that. And he says to this woman, your persistence in the face of my silence, in, in even, in even the, the face of being felt excluded, great faith. That's the kind of faith that the Lord commends. That's saving faith. Can you see why this is an important story? It wasn't their doctrinal understanding. And you know how much important I think that is because the Bible tells us that you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I think doctrinal understanding is important. That's why we're all here today. But let's not confuse doctrinal understanding for saving faith because remember this, friends. The devil understands the pure truth much better than you do. And it's not going to save him. The devil understands prophetic interpretation and the theology of Jesus better than you and I do. That's why he's always, <laughs> before the devil can fight the truth, he needs to know what it is. He's always fighting and opposing and creating counterfeits because he knows what the truth is. So just knowing true doctrine is not saving faith. The two people that Jesus commended for this great faith, they didn't even, were not even church members. Now, getting back to the core of this message. He answered her not a word. We don't know how long she followed him and how long she said, Lord, heal my daughter. She cried after him. It went on a little while. But there was that silence there. And I believe that some of the great faith that she demonstrated was because she did not give up even when she was saying, Do you hear me now? Do you hear me now? She kept asking. Silence can evoke a persistence in prayer. Uh, and God is asking us to have persistence when we pray. Elijah prayed the first time. One time, fire comes down. Then he prays for the rain. It doesn't come after the first prayer or the second prayer or the third prayer. But he has to pray seven times before the rain comes. Why? Did it take the Lord that long to create the evaporation or to find a cloud somewhere and send it His way? God's not hindered by any of those things. Every time we pray persistently when it seems that the heavens are stainless steel above us, it strengthens our faith. Sometimes the silence of God is there to strengthen our faith. Sometimes the silence of God, and let's talk about what those... Wait, let me show of hands again. How many of you have experienced the silence of God? You're wondering where he is, why he's not answering. It's, and you begin to even hear the devil whisper doubts about his existence because it seems like uh, the volume is gone. There's no sound. 
What causes the silence of God? Well, sometimes God's voice is silenced by sin. I want to start here, but I certainly don't want to end here. But it is a fact that sometimes it's because of our behavior we turn the volume down. Let me give you some scripture. Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. What's the problem? But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so he will not hear. God can be silenced by our own sins. Some more examples. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 27 through 29. When your terror, and he's talking about the wicked here, when your terror comes like a storm and your destruction comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. Sounds like what happened with this woman. It says he answered not a word. Here it's because of their wickedness. I will not answer. They'll seek me diligently, but they will not find me because they've hated knowledge and they did not choose the fear of the Lord. Sometimes we can, by a rejecting of God, turn off the volume. Proverbs 28, verse 9. He that turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer will be an abomination. If God speaks to us and we continually say, I don't want to hear it, leave me alone, that voice can get quiet where we don't hear it anymore. And it sounds like God has gone silent on us. I won't ask for a show of hands. But I know that in some marriages... <laughs> One reason I won't is my wife might raise her hand. <laughs> Anyone ever give the silent treatment? Or you ever get the silent treatment? Put your hand down. <laughs> well, there's different ways we communicate. And, uh, you know, in some relationships, uh, when there's tension in the relationship, because of the personality types of the man and the woman, they both get real quiet. There's almost no communication. And then sometimes you've got one who wants to talk things through and one who's the quiet type or just wants to process quietly on their own and uh, one follows the other around the house trying to get it into the discussion mode. <laughs> and what's really bad is when you get the two people that like to talk it out, that's when you get yelling matches. They hyper-communicate. Uh, but sometimes when there's frustration in a relationship, we get the silent treatment. And it's because there's some hurt there and it, it could be because there, we feel like there's been some rejection or some lack of attention. And so we say, I'm going to get your attention by silence. And it's sort of a, um, oh, it's a, it's a tactic that's used to try to get attention, the silent treatment. I'm not saying the Lord does that, but I think sometimes... God may allow us to experience silence after we've had that relationship with Him to wake us up because we're not listening. Some examples of that would be King Saul. It's a very sad example in the Bible, but it's clear enough. Saul was originally chosen by God. Good king. A humble man. The Bible says he stood a head and shoulders above everybody else. But as he became king with some of the prestige and honor and victories in his early... Uh, rain, he began to embrace pride and think, you know, I'm going to do things my own way. After all, I'm king. And he stopped listening to Samuel the prophet. He stopped listening to the Lord. And he just started doing things his own way, started to abuse his office. And the Bible tells us, notice 1 Samuel 14, 37. And Saul got into a pickle and he asked counsel of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? But he did not answer him that day. Every other time, God had answered him in one way or another. Later, as instead of repenting, when he noticed, you see, it says he didn't answer him that day. God did speak to him some more. God gave him the silent treatment that day to say, Saul, you're heading the wrong way. If you want to continue to hear my voice and have me lead you as king, then you need to listen in the other areas. But he didn't. And so finally, it reached the point where the ultimate silent treatment is when you commit the unpardonable sin. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit because isn't that how God speaks to us? And it says that Saul inquired of the Lord and the Lord did not answer him either by dream or by Urim or by Thummim or by prophets. 
1 Samuel 28, 15. Finally, Saul goes to a witch. He wants so bad to hear somebody to break that silence. He doesn't care if it's the devil. And so he goes to witch. And Saul answers and he says to this apparition, God's departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. That was one of the hardest things for him. Now, I get phone calls every now and then from people who are very stressed that they've grieved away the Holy Spirit and committed the unpardonable sin and they say, I don't hear the voice of the Lord anymore. Don't wait until you've got the Philistine army chasing you down before you have the revelation or the realization that God's voice is going quiet. If you notice that heaven is quiet, then seek after God and humble yourself. Uh, there's hope. When Jesus did not answer this woman right away, she persisted in prayer and he answered her. Uh, she humbled herself and said, it's true, I am unworthy, maybe, maybe I am a dog. But he finally answered her. And so don't give up. King Herod, you remember when uh, Jesus came before Herod the king? Jesus talked to Pilate. Why did he talk to Pilate but he didn't talk to Herod? Herod at least was, he had some religious background. He had some Jewish blood in his veins. Jesus wouldn't say anything to Herod. Why? Well, you remember King Herod had John the Baptist as his personal preacher. Knowing that he was an innocent man, he still put him in prison because his wife was hounding him. He knew it was the wrong thing to do. Then he would have John, sort of like a court jester, when he wanted to be entertained, he'd bring John up to preach to him. It used to trouble him. He'd put him back in prison instead of letting him go. Knowing that he was doing the wrong thing, that he was an innocent man, a prophet of God, but he wouldn't listen to him. He told him he shouldn't have Herodias as his, first of all, she was the wrong wife, didn't matter what the history was, but also she had been his brother's wife. And instead of taking care of that, he put Herodias ahead of God. And finally, she got rid of John. And when Herod went through with her plot and had John the Baptist beheaded, now he hears that Jesus is in town and Pilate sends Jesus over to Herod because he said he's from your district of Galilee. Herod uh, wants to see some miracle from Jesus. Luke 23, verse 8. Now Herod saw Jesus. He was exceedingly glad. Oh good, maybe I'll see him turn water into wine. For he desired for a long time to see him because he had heard of the many things about him. Herod wanted to be entertained by the prophets of God instead of converted by them. There's some people who still go to church for those reasons. They find it entertaining. He hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but catch this. But he, Jesus, answered him nothing. Not a word. Why? He that turns away his ear from hearing the law, his prayer is an abomination. And you know why else? Jesus said, Luke chapter 10, verse 16, same book. Jesus said to his disciples, He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And when Herod rejected John, the message of God through John, Jesus said, I have no miracles for you because if the preaching of John the Baptist wasn't good enough for you, nothing I'm going to say is going to make any difference. He had grieved away the Holy Spirit. Some people think, I don't want to hear the preacher. Lord, you speak to me in person. And Jesus said, if you won't hear those that I send, you won't hear me. That's something for us to think about. If an angel came, something entertaining like that, then I'd listen. Jesus said nothing to Herod. He got the silent treatment. But it happens other ways. Sometimes God is silent and it's not because we've done anything wrong. It's because he's maybe trying to strengthen our faith. You have, of course, in the Bible... Let's talk about John the Baptist again from another perspective. Not only did uh, uh, God not listen to Herod because of what he did to John, but John got the silent treatment. Have you ever thought about this? John the Baptist, who was the friend of the bridegroom who proclaimed the coming of Jesus and announced this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, he's later imprisoned by Herod and we don't know, but he may have been in prison for months, probably for months. And Jesus' ministry is continuing to expand and to swell. And John's main purpose in life was to go before the Lord as a voice in the wilderness and prepare people for Jesus. He's even his cousin. We all know that, right? Now John is in prison 
And as his disciples would come and visit him, it tells us that they would come, he'd talk to them and he'd ask about what Jesus is doing. He'd say, did he have any message for me? Did he send you any, any word? Is there any news, any message? No, there was no message. No letter. Nothing. And you know, that must have troubled him. And I think part of that weighed on his soul when he sent the disciples back and he said, John sent his disciples back to Jesus and he, with the question, are you the one? Why would you leave me here? I mean, all the miracles you're performing. I, mean, I was expecting you maybe to sit on the throne, to do something and take the throne of David and of course set me free. But there was nothing. And instead the messengers came back with a message from Jesus. He said, you go tell John, I'm healing the sick and you've seen it with your own eyes. I'm casting out devils. I'm healing the lepers, raising the dead. The blind have their sight restored again. Don't be offended. Do not be discouraged. Blessed is he who is not offended in me. And they brought that message back and John recognized the prophecies in Isaiah that foretold exactly what Jesus was doing and he was satisfied to accept the silence of God. That was the only message he got. But that must have been tough on him. Or what about Martha and Mary? You know, I've had people approach me before and they said, Gee, Doug, are you aware that the Gospel of John wasn't written by John, it was written by Lazarus? Have you ever heard this before? The Gospel of John wasn't written by John. This is a doctrine floating around. It's not new. It was written by Lazarus. You know where that comes from. John never really says he's the author. He refers to himself. How does John refer to himself in his Gospel? The one whom Jesus loved. The one whom Jesus loved. Well, you know, the Bible tells us that Mary and Martha sent a message to Jesus while he was up in Galilee and they were in Bethany. And they said, the one whom you love is sick. Come and heal him. He stayed in their home. They were, there, there's no other family on earth that he was closer to than this family of Martha and Mary and Lazarus, this trio of siblings. And they sent a messenger and the messenger came back and they said, well, what does he say? Well, we told him. What did he say? He didn't say anything. Is he coming? We don't know. We just gave him the message. And two days go by, and three days go by, and four days go by. At this point, he's dead. And that silence must have really been a challenge for Martha and Mary. And when Jesus came, it was the first thing that came out of their mouths. Lord, why didn't you come? When we called you, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. They couldn't understand the silence. Why he let this happen? Jesus had something better in store, didn't he? Here's a point that you shouldn't miss. When your relationship is right with God, the silence of God is often followed by a glorious event. Uh, you may be going, you ever heard the, exp the expression, it's always calmness before the storm? Sometimes God is that way where He allows you to go through a period of silence before something great. And He, of course, was getting ready to raise Lazarus. But before that miracle, their faith was going to be tempered through the furnace of God's silence. Joseph has this dream from God. Someday, people will bow to me. God's got something great in store for me. And then he's sold by his brothers, left in a pit, he cries for their help and they plug their ears. And then he's sold as a slave and he's asking, Lord, why? Silence. He says, Lord, I don't understand it, but I'm going to still try and be true. Falsely accused, put in prison for years. Not modern prison. These are very foreboding prisons in Egypt. Silence. No word from home, no word from God. And he may have wondered, have I been forgotten in this dungeon for years? And then he goes from the prison to the palace. After that spell of silence, God had something great planned for him. Job. Did he go through a period of silence? Just all of these trials and calamities hit him broadside like a storm without warning, just like a train, one after the other lost his family, and lost his possessions, lost his health, and just went bang, 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 bang. All of a sudden he's down on the mat and he's being counted out and he doesn't know what's happened. 
And his friends come, maybe a word from God, and all they do is bring him accusations. And it seemed like God had left him. And he didn't know what he did wrong. And he kept evaluating, Lord, what have I done wrong? And I've tried to be faithful. And his friend said, fess up, you've done something wrong. And he says, you know, I've confessed my sins. I don't know what it is. And that silence that Job went through was a test. Now, you need to make sure, if you're going through a period of silence, are you living up to the light that you know? If God has shown you distinctively some known duty that he would like you to perform and you're ignoring him, you may notice the voice of the Spirit growing fainter and it's not because God is testing you, it's because you are driving him away. That's a very dangerous silence. If you're getting that kind of silent treatment, then you need to really pray and humble yourself before the Lord. Follow what he's revealed to you and it's just common courtesy. If you're talking to somebody and they continually ignore you, don't you stop talking to them after a while. And if God is speaking to us and we turn away from hearing him, he finally says, look, I'll leave you alone. Well, that ought to make you shudder. Praise God, he's patient. Then there's the other kind of silence. There's only two kinds. The silent treatment that God gives to those that are on the way to destruction, and then there's the silent that strengthens the faithful, where he's testing your resolve. You know, it's like sometimes you don't know, you can't see the sun there because the clouds obscure it, and you just got to believe it's still up there even though I can't see it. And even though I can't hear God, I know that He's still there. Sometimes when I'm driving, I can't place a call on my cell phone. It doesn't mean the network is down. It means I'm out of range. You know what I'm saying? I don't worry that the network isn't working anymore and no one in the world can communicate anymore. It's just I'm out of range. And sometimes we just need to evaluate where we are. John 9.31 The Bible says, If anyone is a worshiper of God and does His will, he hears Him. Does God hear our prayers? Amen. Psalms 34.15 The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and His ears are open to their cry. God hears us. Psalm 50 verse 21 These things hast thou done and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest I was altogether such a one as yourself. God says, sometimes I might be silent, but it doesn't mean that I have uh, forgotten you. Finally, the ultimate silent treatment is what Jesus experienced. You could say he took our silent treatment. Silence isn't all bad. Matter of fact, I like an element of quiet. Um, <laughs> there's a song Simon and Garfunkel did years ago called The Sound of Silence. And I remember I have a friend, whenever I try and start singing, he'd say, Doug, I wonder if you could sing a special favorite for me. I'd say, yeah, what is it? He'd say, Doug, can you sing On a Hill Far Away? And then he'd snicker. And what he meant was he wanted me to sing On a Hill Far Away. But then he'd say, Doug, maybe you could sing in the garden alone. <laughs> and then his other favorite one, he'd say, Doug, do you know the sound of silence? <laughs> but, um, you know, silence can be good. It is, and have you ever met those people that just always like noise in the background? And uh, some people are social creatures and they always like that uh, auditory stimuli and they've always got the radios going or the TVs going in the background and, and, uh, they like that noise. I can't concentrate sometimes when there's too much noise around me. I like to hear quiet. Does that, doesn't make sense hearing quiet? Can you hear quiet? Yes, you can hear quiet, can't you? All right, everybody be real quiet. Are you breathing? How many stopped breathing when I said that? <laughs> I did. <laughs> because if Torna to be really quiet, you can't even breathe, can you? <laughs> It's not all that bad, is it? You know why silence sometimes is okay, but when you're with someone for a long time and there's quiet, you wonder if there's something wrong with the relationship. Now, when Jesus suffered for our sins, 
he experienced the ultimate silent treatment. Now what is the lost? What do the lost receive? Eternal separation from God. The ultimate silent treatment. Jesus experienced that beginning in the Garden of Gethsemane. That was extremely painful for him because for every other point, every other moment in his eternal existence, think about this. How long did Jesus exist before the Garden of Gethsemane? From everlasting to everlasting. He'd always been there. Think about this now. God had been there. John chapter 11 verse 42. Jesus said, speaking in his prayer to the Father, I know you always hear me. Up until that point, the Father always heard him. Now he prays in the garden three times, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Was there any answer? Anyone get any, anything you found in your Bible? It's in all four Gospels, I believe. Silence. There was no other way. And then when Jesus goes to the cross and he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That silence. You know, the heavens grew dark to veil the presence of Jesus, almost to insulate him. They have built these isolation chambers that people use for meditating. Any of you heard about this? I think they cost about $1,500 last time I heard. It's a fiberglass room. Because we're living in a world with so much noise, this wasn't in my notes or I would have done it earlier in the sermon, but I just thought about it. They have these fiberglass rooms and you lay in it and they fill it with a warm salt water. So you float. It's supposed to be the ultimate silence. And it's two or three layers of insulation, fiberglass, and this polyplastic. Takes all outside noise out. You step inside. There's these silent fans that keep the circulation to go inside. You get in this room, you float in this semi-salt water that's warm, so you have no sensation of feeling anything around your body, and you put these earplugs in, and it is absolutely quiet. All you can hear is your own heartbeat. And they say it's the ultimate experience of meditation. People that stay in there for a while, they start getting edgy because we're so used to noise all the time. Think about what Jesus went through when that communion was broken with the Father that had always been there. It's like people who live by, you know, a busy airport, take them out and drop them in the desert on a still day. It makes them nervous. They're so used to the, the noise in the background. Jesus had always been in communion with the Father and it's gone. He experienced that ultimate silence for us. But you know what? He had the faith of the centurion and the woman and Job and Joseph and Elijah and the others because even though the Father was silent, when Jesus got baptized, the Father said, This is my beloved Son. On the Mount of Transfiguration, He said, This is my Son. He spoke from heaven. But now there's silence when He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He took that separation for you and me. And, but finally, at the end, the proof that He had faith in spite of the silence is when He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I am going to trust you even though you are not answering me a word. Sometimes we need to just get a hold by faith on God's promises and say, I'm not hearing from Him. I don't know why it seems like I'm forsaken, but I'm going to trust Him. I've been in the hospital at the bedside. I remember visiting a saint a few years ago who was dying and in a lot of pain. And she said, Pastor Doug, I don't understand what's happening, all I can do, the only comfort I find is saying, I'm just going to trust Him. I'm committing myself into His hands. I'm just going to trust Him. There is a specific goal in this message I'm after. I asked you earlier in the message if you've ever felt before that God has been silent and maybe unresponsive. You may be going through one of those periods where you're experiencing the silence of God. You might be going through some medical or physical trial and you feel like God isn't listening. Maybe you've been praying for the salvation of someone you love dearly and it's been the same prayer for years and you wonder, does he hear me? It might be some crisis or situation in your life and you've been praying about it and it seems to go on and nothing is resolved and then this message is for you. Learn from that woman where Jesus said, great is your faith. Why was her faith so great? Because even in spite of his silence, 
she did not let go God wants you to hang on trust that he still loves you and sometimes that silent treatment is to strengthen your faith then again there may be some of you here the volume is growing faint because you're not listening and you want him to turn it up then you need to come and say Lord I'm willing to listen now some of you have heard the Lord speaking to you to say come and accept me you've never accepted Jesus and the plan of salvation you've never said Lord I want you to be my Savior my Lord to forgive my sins I want to choose today to follow you while he's calling on others don't let him pass you by that woman wasn't going to wait for Jesus to come by on another occasion she said he's here now I'm not letting go until he answers my prayer did he answer it did he answer the prayer for the centurion who believed and he will answer yours come if you have heard him calling and you've not responded let's pray father in heaven thank you for the message of Jesus at times it seems as his voice is strange and we don't understand the response or the silence but we're taking the promises in your word and we're developing a bundle and casting them at your feet and saying Lord we're not going to let go and while we may not be worthy we can still trust that you will accept our desperate plea as our greatest eloquence sometimes Lord it seems that the heavens are sealed and we're in this insulation chamber and we're asking the question can you hear me now help us to remember Lord that you are there that you have the very best reception in the world but sometimes we just need to hang on by faith whatever the struggles are that these dear people are going through in the times when it seems that heaven is silent I pray that we'll remember that you are there that you hear every prayer and then Lord I pray that you'll be with us and help us be willing to listen to you sometimes we give you the silent treatment I pray Lord that you'll hear our prayers going heavenward I ask Lord that you be in a special way with those whose faith is maybe just hanging by a thread now because of that silence and and restore it and strengthen that and those who are coming to you for the first time help them find acceptance bless us now through this week and I pray we'll remember you're always listening in Jesus name we pray amen